Thank you for joining. My name is Tanya Hoshi. I'm your realtor. I'm North Coast Chapter Chairman, and I'm here to present agency law. And we'll be targeting our role as an agent, as well as our role as a sub-agent. What we will review is what is agency law, what is agency, the types of agency, parties associated with agency law, types of agents, creation of agency, the types of authority that we do have as agent, duties of the principal, of the agent, of the sub-agent, the rights that we have as an agent and the termination of the agency agreement. What is agency law? It is the relationship between a person who may be categorized as an agent who acts on behalf of a principal, which entails a contractual, quasi-contractual, and non-contractual fiduciary relationships National Association of Realtors defines agency law as a state transaction defines the legal relationship between real estate professionals and their clients. The law of agency is based on the Latin maxim que facit per alium facit per se, which means he who acts through another is deemed in law to do it himself. Agency continues. In the case of Hamilton versus Miller, I'll give you a summary of this case. It's a case 2016 in the Jamaica Appeals Court and it is about an accident. So it was a passenger uh, vehicle and the, the vehicle was overtaken and making an accident to another vehicle. So they're saying that, that Eric Bartley is responsible. However, Eric Bartley was only the driver of Lena Hamilton vehicle. So the persons that was in the other vehicle come together to sue Lena. So Lena on her defense saying that She's not responsible because she no longer owns the vehicle. Lena said she had sold the vehicle, but the documents was not transferred to the new owner. So it was left to McDonald Bishop whether Eric Bart was acting as the agent for Lena Hamilton at the time and to decipher if at the point in time that Lena was the owner of the vehicle. So the judge turned to the Hasbury Law of England 2008 to break down the relationship. So it states the terms agency and agent in popular use have a number of different meanings, but in law the word agency is used to connote the relationship which exists where one person has an authority or capacity to create legal relations between a person occupying the position of principal and their parties. The relation of agency arises whenever one person called the agent has authority to act on behalf of another called the principal and consent so to act. Types of agency. So this agency as agency represent the principal or the customer. Then we have the dual agency. Dual means two, so thereby representing both the principal and the customer. So in our situation in Jamaica, we are dual agency. We both represent the principal and the customer, but further down we will separate 
who we working with and who we working for. So parties associated with agency law. So our principal in real estate is our client, our vendor, or landlord. As for customer, they are our tenants and our purchasers. And our agent is the listing broker, the listing sales agent, and the sub-agent is a cooperating broker and the sales agent. A principal. It's a party who hires or engages the agent to act on their behalf in all matters relating to the agency relationship. The agent therefore is working for the principal and has a fiduciary duty of loyalty and fidelity to the principal, while the customer is the party whom the agent brings to the principal. So the agent owes the customer honesty and fairness and has a duty to disclose any known physical defects to the customer. The agent's prescription for loyalty still remains with the client and therefore the agent is working with the customer and working for the client. Types of agents. We have general agent who is an agent who has the authority to generally carry out transactions for the principal, such as a purchasing agent, a life insurance agent, or even a person who possesses a power of attorney. Unlike us, a realtor, we are a special agent, so an agent who has authority to act for only a specific purpose. So we thereby get a property to rent or a property to sell, and that's a one-off situation. We have agency coupled with interest, as an agent who has property interest in a business which having continued authority to act thereby is dependent on reimbursement, such as a manager that represents a writer or a singer. Subagent is where the agent appoints an agent who is a sorry to assist in carrying out his or her duty. The sub-agent is classified as sub-agent for the principal, as well as the principal and the agents are liable for the sub-agent's conduct. Here we have a chart to detail the, the chain of command and the responsibility to hold all the principal relates to the agent to the sub-agent. So, we can see that there's an arrow, the principal, so we can say for an example, the principal, the vendor, hire us to either sell or rent their property. So being the listing broker, we are the agent. But that document that the principal signed also states that there is a corporate broker. So that corporate broker is the sub-agent. It shows now that you see an arrow going from the sub-agent that leads to the agent and the principal, meaning that the sub-agent has a duty to the agent as well as a duty to the principal. But the sub-agent has those duties through the agent. So the creation of agency. It can be created by agreement, which is governed by contract law. So there must be consideration of formalities, the capacity, and an offer. Operation of the law, which is implied agency and apparent agency. So that is when the court steps in to, 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 give, to see the scenario or the situation that has transpired. And the courts will determine whether it was implied or apparent. Apparent authority by a couple is by way of implying, and there's also out of necessity arises from the operation of the law in case of emergency situation or where it is not practical to reach a vendor. So, for example, if you're a property manager and there is an emergency on the property that, uh, that you manage, 
and it exceeds your your responsibility and you need to get in touch with the vendor and there's no way that you could get in touch with the, the vendor then you will need to make a decision a quick decision so that is how the necessity comes into play then we have ratification and unauthorized act by an agent but there's limitation to that such as it must be disclosed the vendor the, the principal must be disclosed the existence of the principal and it must be ratified on time Therefore, the authority of the agent may be derived expressly from an instrument, either a deed or simply in writing, or may be conferred orally. Authority may also be implied from the conduct of the parties or from the nature of the employment. It may in certain cases be due to the necessity of circumstances, and in others be conferred by a valid ratification subsequent to the actual performance. In addition, a person may appear to have given authority to another and act within such apparent authority may effectively bind him to the third party. Here we have a chart, types of authority. So based upon what we have previously spoken of, now we're going to put it in chart terms. So agency. So we have the actual agreement and we have without actual agreement. Actual agreement is when one receives a written document from the vendor. For example, or multiple listing agreement. Once that is signed, we have now the authority as expressed as well as implied. It could be incidental, customary means usual and a conduct of the parties it depends on on the circumstances at hand without actual agreement is when there is no written agreement but it's just a shake hand or an oral situation so therefore gives you the authority as apparent authority the usual authority as well as operation of the law now, when there's not a written agreement, and for example, all right, I, I have this property to sell, but I don't want to sign any document. But you have my word, man. If you sell it, I'll pay you. Now you get the property sold. When the time comes, you submit your invoice. The vendor not paying you. So thereby you'll need to take into court and that is how the operation of the law come into play and thereby the court will see based upon the transaction between the vendor and the agent to see the implied terms and what has transpired now we're going to present a short video on what we just talked about and this video will break it down a little bit further with a couple of scenarios to apply for a better understanding. Formation of an agency relationship. Agency relationships are a key concept on the real estate license exam. For you to represent any party in a real estate transaction, you must establish an agency relationship. A true agency relationship has additional duties called fiduciary duties that are often required by law. As an agent, you could be held liable for violation of these duties or not performing them as required. To help you remember them, use the acronym OLDCAR. Obedience, loyalty, disclosure, confidentiality, accounting, and reasonable care. In real estate, there are two things that establish agency relationships. An agreement between the parties which creates a documented express agency or the actions of the parties which creates an implied type of agency. 
It is important to note that if the statute of frauds in your state requires real estate agency agreements to be in writing, you might need an express agency agreement to collect a commission from your client. Now, let's look at the different ways of forming an agency relationship. Express agency. Express agency creates an agency relationship through an agreement between an agent and a principal. The agent and the principal state their intentions to enter into an agency relationship in which the agent will represent the principal. They can do this either orally or in writing, but not all states consider oral agreements to be enforceable. This means that it is possible for an oral agreement to establish an agency relationship, but not be enforceable by you, the agent, to collect a fee. The typical written agreement is a listing agreement or a buyer's agency agreement. In practice, you want to work with agreements as much as possible. That way, the details of your transaction are all documented and protected by law. Implied agency. Implied agency establishes an agency relationship through the actions of the two parties. This happens when nothing formal has been agreed or written down, but the agent and the principal act as if they had an agency relationship anyway. Creating an implied agency may not have been what the two parties intended, but it could still be the result of their actions. For example, Susan is selling her home by herself and puts up a for sale sign on the lawn. Stephen drives by, sees the sign, and stops in. Stephen identifies himself as a real estate agent and asks some questions about the house. Susan tells Stephen that she doesn't want to list the house with any real estate brokerage, but it's okay for him to bring by any possible buyers to them to view the house. The next day, Stephen brings the Bowers, who really like the house and want to make an offer. Stephen tells Susan and begins negotiating a deal. A month later, the Bowers close on the deal and everybody's happy until Susan tells Stephen she doesn't owe him a commission. It will be up to a judge to make a final decision in a case like this, but it's likely that Stephen and Susan have established an implied agency relationship based on their actions and Susan will have to pay up. Agency by estoppel. Estoppel is a tricky one. Let's use Stephen and Susan again to help us explain it. Susan is standing in front of her house putting up her for sale sign when Stephen stops to talk to her about the house. A potential buyer walks past and asks about the house too. Susan, who thinks she's funny, says, why don't you ask Stephen here? He's an agent. The potential buyer gets Stephen's business card and calls him later about Susan's property. Even though there is no formal agreement, if Susan allows the potential buyer to continue believing that Stephen is her agent, there could be an agent by estoppel. Estoppel is a legal principle which says that a person cannot go back on something they previously said. In this case, it means that Susan can't allow a buyer to think that Stephen is her agent and then later deny that it happened. Said the other way, an agency by estoppel is created when a principal doesn't stop an agent from going beyond the agent's normal duties, thus giving someone else the impression that there is an agency relationship. Agency by ratification. An agency by ratification happens when someone has no authority to perform an action and does it anyway, and the principal later adopts the act. With the agency by ratification, an agency relationship is created retroactively by accepting the circumstances that created the agency after the fact. Suppose Carol is a real estate agent who knows Vivian is trying to sell her home. Carol negotiates a deal for Vivian's house without authorization without ever speaking to Vivian about it. One day, Carol arrives with a completed contract. All Vivian has to do is accept the deal and sign the paperwork and her house is sold. If Vivian accepts the deal and signs, she has effectively ratified what Carol has been doing and probably created an agency by ratification. I say probably because Carol wants a fee for her services and she may have to sue Vivian to collect. When that is the case, it is ultimately up to the courts to determine if there is an agency relationship or not. Agency coupled with interest. An agency coupled with an interest can happen when an agent has some kind of interest in the property that's being sold. For example, suppose Joe is a part-time broker. He is also an architect and he agrees to design some houses for a builder who will give Joe the listing for the finished house. 
Because Joe made an investment in the project, the builder can't cancel the agreement. It is now an agency coupled with interest. This might sound like a tie-in agreement, which would be a violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act. And this would have been the case if Joe required the builder to hire him as an architect as well as a broker. But Joe isn't making one activity conditional on the other. He is simply offering both services and the builder agreed. In an agency coupled with interest, it is as if Joe was investing in the project. Most agency relationships are established in writing, with different agreements for buyers and seller agency relationships. Listing agreements involve sellers. Buyer agency agreements involve buyers. Each has multiple types of agreements. The different agreements have many similarities, like the types of duties to be performed. One thing that stays the same are the fiduciary duties of the agent. Remember to use the acronym Old Car: Obedience, Loyalty, Disclosure, Confidentiality, Accounting, and Reasonable Care. I hope this helps you understand the different ways agency relationships are formed. Until next time, remember to keep it concise and keep it simple. Now we turn to types of authority as it relates to the liability on contracts made by agents. So we have a disclosed principal, undisclosed principal, and principal subsequently disclosed. So for a disclosed principal, whereas the agent has actual authority, I know that there is an error where it says P can sue P, but it is actually P can sue the third party, also the third party can sue P. There's also agent has no actual authority where it can be, can P can, the principal can ratify what the agent had done. And if it's been ratified, then the principal can sue the third party if the third party does not proceed with the agreement that was made with the agent and then the third party can sue P based upon the, the agreement that the agent had made. Breach of warranty by agent, once there's a disclosed principal, then the third party can sue the agent. We have the undisclosed principal where there is no actual authority or actual authority, so the agent can sue the third party as well as the third party can sue the agent. Where the principal subsequently disclose and has actual authority, the third party can sue either the agent or the principal, but there's exceptions of course, and when there's, there's exceptions, if there's an exception, then the third party can sue A only. So that basically if the agent has gone outside as, as something that is illegal, then the third party can only sue the agent and not the principal. When there is no actual authority, the principal can sue the third party. Then did the agent exercise usual authority? If so, the third party can sue the principal. duties of the principal to act dutifully and in good faith to provide relevant or certain information or document to the agent to keep the agent informed duty to remunerate the agent so once we're going to get a listing we know that we require certain documents so we need the proof of uh, ownership we need the id to substantiate that yes that is the, the, the principal that owns a property as well if there's any changes or if there is any purchaser that approaches the the property to speak to the principal then the principal has a duty to inform their agent as well as a duty to remunerate the agent so once a property is being sold we have accomplished what the contract said we need to do then it is now the principal is supposed to compensate us, which is for commission.
the duties of an agent may arise from the fiduciary relationship as well as an agency agreement. So as fiduciary relationship, it relates to to avoid conflict of interest, not to make secret profits or take bribes, to be able to account for any payment received. So the conflict of interest, so if you're managing a property and you have like a plumbing company, you will need to disclose that information to the principal to say, okay, we have a plumbing issue, yes, but you know, this is my company, but you have to make it known. Not to make secret profits or to take bribes. For example, you get a property, the listed price is for X amount of dollars, so first you have, say, $20,000. But then now we put on a, a price, say for example, thirty thousand, and then we pocket the difference of ten. That is breaching of the fiduciary relationship between the principal and the agent. To be able to account for any money, any payment received. So whether you're managing a property or you're having an item. Um, to be sold or sell for the, the principal, you need to be accountable for it and that must be reported. Agency agreement, duty to follow instructions. The principal is our employer. We need to abide by what we are saying. Although, there are exceptions that we need to advise the owner or the principal as it relates to any form of illegality or what the law says or what is required. Prime example is in the Gotha versus Bertram case. There is also a duty to use reasonable care and skill imply terms that is embedded in the Supply of Goods and Service Act of 1982 Section 13, which is a persuasive means for better understanding of what it is for reasonable care and skill. Not to delegate his authority to a sub-agent unless there is an express or implied consent from the principal. In this situation, the multiple listing agreement that the vendor signed, that is where he is given his express, express authority, yes, to go ahead and cooperate with another agent, which is a sub-agent, to get the property sold or the property rented. Likewise, for sub-agent, the responsibility of an agent flows down to a sub-agent. So basically, a sub-agent and an agent works together hand in hand side by side to accomplish a main goal and is to dispose of the principal's property disposing by selling disposing by renting so again the duties of the agent flows automatically to the sub agent and the agreement between the agent and the principal flows down the sub agent. So here goes, we we'll present a video at this time that will give you scenarios to explain what we have just talked about. We do hope that you enjoy the short video. This is Joe from Prep Agent, and today we are going to talk about the basic principles of an agency relationship. This could be the most important video of your life. Well, maybe not, but it will help you pass the exam, so let's go. An agent is a person who has been legally empowered to act on behalf of another person or entity. 
This is not the same as having power of attorney where one person has the power to act as another person for that one act. Real estate licensees often act on someone else's behalf in real estate transactions. They are an agent acting on behalf of a client or principal. So it's important to understand the law of agency that defines the rights, duties, and responsibilities of all legal parties. Once an agency relationship has been created, there are some fundamental responsibilities that the agent must legally follow. If an agent violates one of these duties or doesn't perform them as required, they can be held liable. And in real estate, being held liable usually involves lawyers. Yuck, I think I'd rather get root canal, so pay attention. To help you avoid the lawyers, judges, and nasty papers being delivered to your door, remember these fundamental responsibilities using the acronym OLCAR. O is for obedience, L for loyalty, D for disclosure, C for confidentiality, A for accounting, and R for reasonable care. Obedience. Agents must obey the client's lawful instructions. Let's say you're an agent representing a seller who has received two offers. The first offer is much better than the second, but the seller instructs you to accept the second offer because the person who made the first offer did not go to prom with the seller when they were in high school 20 years ago. You may feel that the seller is being ridiculous and petty, but as an agent, it's your responsibility to obey the instructions of your client. Later, you could tell the offer or they should have given the kid with braces a chance. That's not to say you have to follow every instruction. For example, if a seller refuses to consider an offer based on a reason that violate fair housing laws, such as race, you should not and legally cannot follow those instructions. Loyalty. When it comes to the real estate transaction, agents must put their client's best interests ahead of anyone else's, including their own. Do what is best for the client, not the commission checks. For example, as a buyer's agent, you should never give preference to any property because of a bonus. It doesn't matter if the bonus is money or a cookie, even if it is one of those awesome Thin Mint Girl Scout cookies so good. If you think the property is a good fit for the buyer, go ahead and show the property. But the duty of loyalty requires you to tell the buyer about the bonus before writing up a purchase offer. And if your buyer is good with it, you're good to go. Disclosure. Agents must disclose any information they receive that could benefit the client's position in negotiation. For example, if you represent a buyer and you know the seller has a pending offer on another house, it's your duty to disclose that information to your client. You must also disclose any material facts, anything that might cause the buyer to change their actions regarding the purchase. If you're doing a walkthrough and you notice a hole in the front porch, make sure your client knows about it. Confidentiality. Agents should never disclose any information learned about their clients. It does not matter if it has to do with their business, finances, personal affairs, or their reason for doing the deal. The fiduciary duty of confidentiality lasts forever. It does not just end when the deal is done. For example, if you know your client lost their job and is selling because of their financial situation, that information goes with you to the grave. Unless, of course, a court instructs you to disclose certain items that they deem legally necessary. Accounting. Agents are responsible for accurate accounting of all money and documentation associated with the transaction. This includes accurate record keeping. I know, boo, math. Reasonable care. Agents are expected to have a certain level of knowledge and to be able to advise and guide clients through a process without harm. Licensed real estate professionals are legally held to a standard that can be hard to pin down, which is why agents should be smart when it comes to reasonable care. For example, as a real estate agent, your clients will expect you to knowledgeably advise them on prices, inspections, negotiations, repairs, and many other facets of a transaction. If questions come up that you don't know, you're expected to advise them on how to obtain the information they seek. Be careful not to offer advice or services of which you are not qualified just to please your clients. The old expression, stay in your lane, applies here. Using our earlier example of the hole in the patio, 
you should not offer advice on what causes patio holes and how to replace the patio. Instead, you should advise the client to listen to a certified inspector. Just like you, they had to take an annoying test to do what they got to do, so let them do their thing. Well, that's it for now. Remember the acronym OLD CAR, which stands for Obedience, Loyalty, Disclosure, Confidentiality, Accounting, and Reasonable Care, and you will do great on your real estate exam. This is Joe from Prep Agent. Remember to keep it concise and keep it simple. Thank you very much. I hope you have enjoyed that short video. Now, rights of an agent. The agent has a right to the following. Remuneration, which is our service commission. Indemnify, basically if there's anything that's supposed to occur that the principal will not hold the agent responsible, as well as a lien, just in case that the principal does not follow through in remuneration, then the agent can take a lien on the principal's property, such as um, their title. They can put a stop on their title to claim for their commission that they have not, they have not received. So remuneration, indemnify, and a lien. When agency agreement is terminated, it can be terminated by agreement, so it's an agreement by both parties. Frustration of the contract, for example, we get a property to sell and we, have, we don't have um, access to the property such as the key, so each time we will need to call to get a copy of the key. To go and show the property but each time we're calling the owner to show the property there's always some excuses that we cannot get access to show the property so that basically will frustrate the contract death of either, either party it takes two to go in a, into to an agreement insanity of either party of unsound mind no, 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 lack of reasoning, going mad, that will terminate an agreement. Bankruptcy of the principal, as well as bankruptcy of the agent. So we're at the end of our presentation and I hope you have gotten additional information as it relates to agency law and the reasoning for doing this presentation is to let our realtors know the agents and the sub-agents is to work together hand in hand side by side for a common outcome and that is to dispose of the principal's property that we get to rent or to sell and thereby we have a duty as the agent and the sub-agent to follow the instructions, the authority from the principal and we should not abuse the authority that the principal gives to us. So therefore, we do have a fiduciary duty to the principal 
So I'll close and remark, and before we go, our previous case with Lena Hamilton, I guess you're wondering what was the outcome. So the case presented to you was at the, the appeals court. So the end of that case is that Lena Hamilton case appeal was allowed and that was based upon that she proved that she could not be vicariously liable for the damage that had caused because she was no longer the owner. So she had successfully proved and to show although the person who she had sold the car to did not transfer but she had her documents to show at the time when she had sold the vehicle and at the time of the accident she is not responsible so lena hamilton case appeal was allowed so here we have it the agent and the sub agent is working with the customer and working for the client remember we have a duty to disclose to the customer but remember we are not working for the customer it is that we are working with the customer and we are working for the client and it is the client the principal that compensate us for the good work that we have done or for what we will do as a reminder the agent and the sub agent work together as one for a common goal and we work with the customer and we work for the client I want to thank you very much for your undivided attention in this presentation and we crave your feedback also if you have any questions or concerns please feel free to put it in the chat this presentation is focused to our members or realtors member here in Jamaica and again, as a reminder, realtors, fellow realtors, we are working for the client and we are working with the customer. We thank you. And as always, our motto, the voice of real estate, I'm your presenter, I'm your hosting. The chairman for the North Coast chapter, we thank you and have a good one.